Thanks, Rabbi, to you accepting for uh, my uh, interview. And uh, for people that will be uh, watching this video, I'm uh, with uh, Robbie Frank, which is a business coach. And uh, he had been coached with a lot of uh, really successful people in many countries in the world. And he's also a coach making people uh, go forward in their business and in their mindset. So, Robbie, how have you found your passion? Um, I, I don't think that I um, found it. I think that I was very lucky that it found me. Um, most people, they have to actually experiment. So um, for me, uh, since age eight, 16, I guess, I already uh, was very interested in self-development and I actually started with everything related to meeting women. And what would happen is I, I got really good at it at some point. And the next thing I did immediately when I got good at it was start teaching other people how to do it. Um, not like teaching like a classroom environment, but like helping them think better and, and kind of have epiphanies and, and take actions that are more properly aligned with the way you should do it. And that really gave me a kick, like a high. And that was already a sign that something was up. And what happened from there on is every time I would do something else in life or business um, or as an employee, which I actually had a lot of success as an employee, um, every time it would call me to come back. Um, I, I believe every person that lives by his truth and kind of goes by his intuition and listens to what it says, he will uh, kind of like... Uh, coincide with his passion and kind of like rub, rub elbows with it at least a couple of times um, in his early life, like till age 24. So, so I believe anybody who lives, lives like truthfully and, and through his intuition will uh, by age 24, at least have some idea of what his passion is. And uh, just, just to clarify, when I say passion, I mean that thing that no matter how much you do it, like you don't, it doesn't get old. Like you always want to keep doing it more and more and more. Perfect. Perfect. So um, what tips will you give to an entrepreneur that wants to start in business? An entrepreneur that wants to start the business. Um, well, I, I guess that's a bit of the too, too much of a vague question. Um, can you give like a, a bit more of a kind of like a specific example? Well, there, let's say there's someone that, like want to start his business, what will be like the first step you will tell him to do to that person? Oh, okay. Um, well, the, the way I look at it is like in terms of leverage, it's what would be the, what would do like the biggest ripple effect out of everything. So, you know, some, some people think, oh, you need to learn about the field. Um, that's not, that's true, but truth is relative. It's not, absolute um, in terms of what's true is what works. So it's more true. Um, like for example, if you, if you uh, need to get to a place that's like an hour drive away, it, you can get there by walking, but it's more true to do that by driving because it, it's just the more efficient uh, leverage solution uh, to achieve your goal, less effort, more uh, time. Um, you, I mean, you have more time left. In terms of the business, uh, so uh, doing like a business plan, no, uh, that's, that's one way, but it's extremely uh, slow. Um, just starting out and seeing what happens, no. Uh, in my um, experience, on literally like 100% of the cases, the single fastest way to move forward, like the single biggest ripple effect if you really, really want to get ahead fast, and not just in business, by the way, it's a, it's a principle of life, is to find somebody who's at least uh, 10 times better than what you want to be at the moment. So you just start out a business, and at least you, you want to start a business, and uh, you aim to make uh, 10 grand uh, a month by the end of the year or by in a year or two, find somebody who's doing like 10 times that. And if you manage to stick yourself with that person, like get really close to them and spend half an hour a day with that person, or even just an hour or two, like 
twice, three times a week, your brain will soak up like a sponge everything that they're doing. And the way actions work is based on belief. So if you don't have any other point of reference to what's possible, and when I mean what's possible, I don't mean, mean what people told you that's possible, but what you actually saw with your eyes, that's possible. Because even if somebody's like, hey, I'm a multimillionaire, you can do it too. Unless you see that this is a living person, like a living flesh person, you'll never believe it, that he's it's truly possible. Maybe you'll somewhat deceive yourself, but you won't, you won't fully believe it. And we work based on point of reference. So you always, uh, when you don't have a mentor or you don't have anybody who's like much, much better than you, you basically move in steps. So you aim to the next step. So let's say you're at nothing. You aim for, you know, ten, a $10 sale. And then you've got a $10 sale. Now you aim for $20. And now you aim for, you know, another sale and a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. And you always aim in small, small steps, just the next step. But when you have like, let's say you're here and you have somebody who's here uh, and you, you know it's real because you've seen him, you've talked to him, he's in your life. That means that you'll always look and you see this is the possibility. I know it's possible. So instead of aiming like this high, you'll actually aim here. And when you, uh, you can try this experiment, when you look, let's say you want to get to like a door that's like 20 meters from you. If you look at the floor, you can literally only take like the tiniest steps because you don't see what's in front of you. You just see just a bit in front of you. So you can't make, take any major, major steps, but the further you look away, the faster you seem to get to places. So uh, this is by the way, a trick. Like if you want to get someplace fast, don't look at the floor. Don't look like in the mid uh, length, but look as far away as you can see in the horizon. And because you don't see the depth anymore because it's so far away, you'll actually be taking the biggest steps without even noticing. Uh, so, so that's really something I found which is insane. Like I have a friend, uh, just as a quick, uh, two examples even, uh, in terms of my ascent with coaching and getting really, really good at closing high paying clients, I literally found a guy from Europe who was doing that on a very high level, like making I think like $50,000 a month uh, from coaching. And I paid him a ton of money just to align myself with him. And I said, I'll do anything to work with you. And I worked with him uh, and, and did anything to be next to him. And within about two months of doing that, maybe a month and a half, I myself started closing a uh, thousand plus dollar uh, clients with a lot of ease. Like it wasn't even hard to do that. And most people were taking them like years, if any, if, if, if they'll even succeed in doing that. Um, and that was because of the belief because I saw it's possible with my own eyes. Same thing with online business. And I mean like passive income. I have another friend named Ben who makes I think $100,000 a month. He's just 23 years old uh, using, you know, sales funnels and Amazon and selling courses. And when I wanted to start making money with the autobiography book that I wrote, um, you know, he kind of came into my life because he was a really good friend when we were younger. And I saw him making, you know, over a hundred thousand uh, dollars in the living flesh. You know, this is a friend of mine. This is a person I know. And immediately my, my vision jumped so much forward that in the first two months, I myself started making about two, three hundred dollars a month uh, from passively selling my book online uh, just by not, he wasn't even helping me that much. Like maybe we we're talking a couple of, like every two, three days, just like a quick chat. But the fact that he was in my life and that's like where I was aiming is what made it happen in uh, two months instead of like a year. So, so that, that's my bi single biggest tip is fun. Not just in business, in anything that you want to get like really far in, like fitness, uh, spirituality, meditations, uh, in intellect, like anything you want to improve substantially. Just find somebody who's like 10 times better than what you think you want. And you'll get there so fast, it will completely shatter your reality because you'll realize that there are no, the walls that you thought you had, like you thought you needed to move in small increments. It's not true. You can actually move in huge steps. That's how Great. people like, like uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and so on, they, they become billionaire. Like people don't realize that, but, 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 but Mark Zuckerberg, was mentored by Bill Gates and Bill Gates was mentored by Warren Buffett, you know, and it's not a coincidence that each one gets there faster than the other one. 
Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's truly amazing. Like how, how mentorship is, uh, the single biggest accelerant of progress that men has ever discovered. Great. So, um, how have you known that what you're doing right now, it's the right thing for you? Because it feels meaningful. Um, now this is a big mistake that I actually made in the past, uh, where I would, uh, I actually reached a point where I was making uh, around ten thousand dollars a month from coaching. I was working like ten hours a week, traveling the world, and I felt like shit. And the reason I felt like shit was because I was aiming on the at the wrong things. I was aiming at comfort and luxury and not meaning. So instead of like uh, taking up you know higher paying clients and challenging myself, like let's see if instead of closing three thousand dollar clients, I can close five thousand dollar clients, or let's see. How, if I can take them further than I even thought. Uh, instead of that, I was kind of just moping around, just going to expensive restaurants, um, you know, kind of oversleeping. And I lost my passion. So I would coach people, it would not feel fun anymore. And I thought that, the, that just the coaching wasn't the right thing anymore. And I, that was a big mistake that I, I was very impatient. And I just quit the coaching and tried something else and then again found out that was a really stupid mistake and came back to it um so when it feels meaningful uh that's when you know you're at the right place uh your body has an almost pretty much an instinctive uh part in the brain where it recognizes meaning uh and you know you know something is meaningful when you start losing track of time uh when it just feels like the right thing and we, we all know that what that is, which is incredible that, you know, I don't have to explain to you what it means to say when you, something feels like a meaningful, like it's really important. It's really good that you're doing it. Everybody knows exactly what that means, even though every person is literally like completely different than the other person. Um, so once you have a handle on your passion, uh, your passion is like the closest approximation to that thing at which you operate in the highest capacity. Uh, it's that thing that will allow you to express yourself most deeply and in the most meaningful way. And if you love it and embrace it and really take it up like, like something that you uh, appreciate, then like if, for example, for me, when I appreciate the coaching, meaning I, I don't use it to satisfy me, I, I, I satisfy the coaching. So I look at it like an ideal or something that's conti a continual strive uh, for for improving and, and using it like, like, a, like a sharpening saw for my, my character and my being, then it rewards you bigger, better than anything else you could ever do. Like the, I've been in so many situations in my life where I was in deep shit. I thought it's, you know, it took me like months or years to get out of it. And the moment I go back, I go back to coaching, the moment I, I align myself with that meaning again, life just immediately spirals up quicker than you can even imagine. Like suddenly money comes in uh, really fast, appreciation, love, uh, and my thinking gets better. Everything just, it, it, it's like everything gets lifted up. Uh, they say, uh, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that's like your biggest rising tide is when you do that meaningful thing out of love for the meaning and not uh, out of trying to get something from it. Yeah, it's, and it's true when you find like the thing that is meaning and you do it, it, it makes every other things more easy to do. Yeah, it's like life becomes uh, bearable again. Uh, because it, it really, because when you don't have that, life is extremely, life is extremely tough. Life is, is mostly suffering and mostly pain. And it's the things we do that make life worth living in spite of the fact that life is, is a shitty thing. Like, Anybody who read like 20th century uh, literature about what happened like 50, 60 years ago, I'm not talking about Nazi Germany, I'm talking about like everything. <laughs> uh, life is shit, like bad things happen all the time. But when you find meaning in life, when you find meaning, something that you can continually improve your, your char character through, then suddenly life gains this uh, almost transcendent meaning where now it's worth living. It's not just something you bear or you suffer through. It's something you actually suffer through with, with pride. You actually feel good. 
Great. And uh, what is what is the message that you have to give to the world? Like, what is the message you want to give with your business? Well, um, over the years, the message has changed as I discovered my values. I literally separate my life into four categories. Uh, the first one is before knowing what my values are. And I, always, I believe there are three values to every person. Like there's not more than three and not less than three. It's always like three. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, the, the rule of threes, by the way. It's, it's a common rule of life that you can pretty much distill everything to three things. Um, and that, you can't usually distill it to two and four is too much. Three is always the, the, the most, the best, like the ideal number, because three is the, is the lowest number, uh, that can, for something that can support itself. So basically a triangle is the minimal shape that can support itself. Um, you know, less one, one less than that. And it's basically just a line. It can support itself. It's not a shape. And one more, again, it's, it's less than the ideal. Um, so the three uh, values, the three ways I changed my life is the first one is I discovered growth. And, you know, that my, one of my, the, my first biggest value was growth. And anything that relates to progress and growth, you know, the faster the growth, exponential growth, leveraging, that's like, it just turns me off. Like, that's what makes me move. Uh, that catapulted my life. And basically, I tried to make everybody grow. But the problem is growth, it needs to have roots as well. And that was, you know, I, I, I was growing way too fast for, sorry, for a 21-year-old guy uh, without, you know, not that good of, par of parenting, um, skipped the army, um, skipped school. Like, I didn't have really a good backbone for ethics. So I did really dumb stuff that you do when you have a lot of money and power. Uh, an influence. And I thought growth is everything. So, you know, I fucked up a lot of people. I fucked up myself pretty much. Uh, I also helped a lot of people substantially. But uh, yeah, there was no roots. It was not good. And that led me to the second period, which was discovering uh, ethics and truth, which is my second value. Basically, the, the roots of uh, growth have to be ethics, because when you grow, but there's no uh, base of ethics, uh, you know, it's like a ship that you know, when it's on the ground, it can have like flaws. It can like, like screws don't need to be tied. You know, there can be a bit holes and stuff. But the moment it goes up in space, the higher it goes, the more pressure is on the cabin. And at, at a certain height, if there's even like a slightly screw loose, the whole ship is going to blow up or, or get wrecked. So, so if you want to go up and progress, you have to actually have ethics and because the slight mistake at a certain height, the slight mistake will destroy you if you're not properly aligned in ethics. So that um, was the second kind of breakthrough after doing again a lot of really dumb shit. And that's when I started also teaching ethics and teaching people how to think, not just how to think in terms of like quick growth, but how to think in terms of having good character and um, being an ethical person. Uh, which is in of itself and, you know, one of the most important goals in life because you can't always grow, you know, not, it's not always good times like right now, you know, capitalist mania where you can just build a business entrepreneurial, you know, sometimes you're a person who's stuck in Nazi Germany or, or, you know, Stalinist Russia and all, you can't grow anything, but you can have ethics at least and, you know, not end up like a horrible person. Um, because you understand yourself. And the third value, which actually kind of recently came to me, uh, my, the final value, I believe, uh, is uh, love, uh, which sounds really dumb. I know <laughs> I, that's what I would think, but uh, I discovered it through my relationship. So the girl I'm very likely going to marry, uh, basically the first time I ever decided to completely commit to somebody and stay with them no matter what. And that's when I discovered the power of commitments uh, where uh, by committing to a, to a person and being with them, you know, deciding, okay, this person is good enough for me to like not let them go no matter what, then you go into depth uh, that you never thought you had in you because now when there's clashes between people, 
that's why I also am into the idea of having somebody that's different from you, not somebody who's exactly like you. Uh, so when you clash and you have to work it out uh, because you're not going to leave each other, then uh, you really grow. So that's kind of like my, my, my creme, you know, of the, in the top message. It's, so it's growth, it's ethics, and the love part is where it kind of brings it all together because, you know, if, if there's growth, then again, that's abundance. Uh, that's awesomeness. Uh, if there's ethics, that's what roots you where the growth is, doesn't become cancer. It becomes, you know, it stays good. But the love is something to grow for. So it's somebody that you want to do it for because we'll never do as much for ourselves as we'll do for somebody that we really love. That's the reason why pretty much every single successful person you'll find in history uh, has had a loved person behind him. You know, history was pretty much dominated by men, not entirely, but almost entirely. And pretty much every single great man, you know, from uh, Henry Ford up to um, uh, Napoleon, uh, you know, because I know you're French, uh, they all had wives. And the moment Napoleon left his wife, because he got kind of uh, felt he was too great for his wife, done. Like everything started crashing. So the effects of having a woman or a man that you will do anything for and be committed to that grounds you and it makes that growth continual, not, not just in the spurs. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it's really interesting. Um, so now more, more technical, how do you plan your, uh, your goals? How do I, um, choose goals how do i um, really how do you plan them when i have a goal how do i plan it yeah well i i do kind of a more um action based way so i'm less of a thinking type you know and this advice will not be good for uh 60% of the people but people who really relate to like taking action and i don't mean the others don't i just mean people who are like mostly focused on action and less on uh, technicality, uh, because some people really like to think and strategize. Um, what I do is I simply, uh, you know, call it like my goal system. I, I have a, you can search in my YouTube channel, like the goal system, uh, for like a 30 minute video about it. But I simply, uh, I found that what motivates me is actually negative, uh, motivation. It's not positive. So what that means is what motivates me is not like, what I could attain and how amazing that would be. It's actually the risk of what I would lose if I fail on the way, uh, which, you know, kind of like a deadline or something that keeps me going. Uh, so whenever I have a goal, I simply decide on a deadline for it. I choose a, 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 something to lose. For example, I recently went back to making videos after kind of a hiatus of a couple of months and I made the decision to do 30 videos in 15 days. So going back to two videos a day from not like from zero. And my risk, my commitment was, I told my, I said to my girlfriend that if I fail to do this challenge, if I don't do 30 videos in 15 days, I'll break my phone, uh, close my YouTube channel and eat a big ball of wasabi, which is really, really spicy Japanese food. And I came up, what I do when I, is I set up the goal. Okay. Okay. This is what I want to, what I want to achieve. I ask my, I start asking, do I want to break this down into actions? Do I not? So it depends. Sometimes I did crazy stuff. Like I did this with like an 800 people lecture where I came back from Thailand to Israel and I wanted to do an 800 people lecture. It was like a huge inspiration that, at that moment. So I called up like a huge uh, um, uh, lecture hall and I paid them up front uh, about $15,000 um, to rent the place for the night. And I booked it two and a half weeks in advance without having a single person. 
So, and no strategy, because you, know, you can't have a strategy when you don't know how to do it. But I trusted the power of commitment that I will do my best. And I got to 500 people. So in that time, because of that necessity in those two weeks, I think I worked like 18 hours a day. I did one lecture every day for a whole week at night uh, to get more people. I did like 15 coaching calls every single day. I got on the biggest Israeli media news outlet. I made three viral videos that got um, uh, covered and even parodied by famous comedians in Israel. Uh, so generated like an immense amount of just movement and action and influence because I did things that I would never be able to do without that commitment, which is why I tell people that there's no such thing as a comfort zone in the absolute sense. People think like, this is my comfort zone or this is my comfort zone. Like, no, it's relative. Your comfort zone changes based on the necessity. So the more pressure you have on you to accomplish something, the bigger your comfort zone gets because you'll be able to do more. And the best example I like to give is like, if let's say, you're someone you care about, like your mother, your brother, your son, daughter, uh, wife, uh, something happens to them and you're going to have to get a thousand dollars by the end of the day, uh, from people or they're going to die or something, then you're not going to have any reservations about it. You're going to run up to people in the street and just beg them for money. And you won't even think about like, Oh, it's outside my comfort zone. <laughs> like it, it's gone. So comfort zone is literally based on necessity. So if you have any problem with comfort zone, like, you know, you're afraid to approach women or to make that cold call, increase the necessity, make sure that you have to do it. And th then the comfort zone is not a problem because when you have to do some something, you just do it. Um, so that's what I do is I play with it. I play with the, the risk part where I set, a, set up a commitment. I make sure it's not too stressful where it'll make me crash because I had that kind of experiences and it's horrible. And I make sure it's not too easy where I won't feel like, you know, I have something to lose. So I find like the right amount of stress and it makes me focused and I always achieve the goal. So when I set up the goal and set up the proper commitment that feels right in my intuition, I always achieve it. Not a single time have I not been able to achieve it, like to where I had to like, suffer the consequences. If the, again, if I said it based on my intuition and my intuition said, you know what, it's hard, but I think you can do it. Like you can go for that, commit to it. So, so that's my system for, you know, setting up goals. Great. And um, what would you say to an entrepreneur that don't want to start his business because like something is missing, let's say money, experience, uh, time, <clears throat> um, so to you mean okay so there's an excuse basically yeah um, it's not the right time because uh, experience time money you know, many other reasons mm -hmm. well um, there won't be a better time <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much what I can say like it's, it's not going to get better like all you need to do is look you know you don't even look need to look in books or in history just look at your own life has there ever been a time where you were like you know you procrastinated with something i don't mean where you strategically chose to wait like you know oh my wife is uh she's in right now she, she, we're having a kid so i'll wait like half a year to you know get promoted so i have more time that's strategic but have you ever like procrastinated on something and it actually turned out like that was the right call. Like, Oh, I'm so happy. I procrastinated with, uh, you know, asking for a promotion. Uh, you know, while somebody catches your promotion, somebody else like takes it or something like it's never because yeah, maybe you could get more, you'll have more money later, but maybe not, maybe not. Maybe you'll have less. Uh, maybe you'll have more time later. Maybe no, maybe you have, you don't have more, you know, like, it's, it's really kind of a logical error. It's really like bold to say, I know that in the future it will be better. Like you don't, like, it could be a whole lot worse. Um, you are where you are now. And if you don't show any intentions towards the universe to that, you want to move forward, 
the universe is going to say, okay, I, I gave you the opportunity. I'm going to show it to somebody else now. And you just, you just won't do it. Like how many people do you know where the story is like, yeah, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I procrastinated and then I did it. Like, it's like I procrastinated and then unless something really, really bad happens, you're just going to keep procrastinating. So I call this the kind of lottery mentality where you hope for a disaster unconsciously. So it's like people who they, they won't admit it a lot of times unless they are really honest, but what they're doing is they're waiting for a disaster. So they're waiting for something to fuck their life up so bad that they won't have a choice. Like people who they don't like their spouse or partner. So they're just waiting for that excuse. They're actually waiting for that partner to cheat on them or something. So the partner cheats on them, which, you know, obviously because they kind of made it happen unconsciously. And then they're like 80% pissed off and angry, but 20%, like they're like, oh, this is my chance, you know, to get out. Like, yay, <laughs> freedom. Uh, so exactly the same, like, like, you know, please fire me, you know, fire me for my job, you know, so that I don't have an excuse anymore to open up my business. Um, again, it's the same thing, just create necessity. It's like, it's people who don't understand goals. Like you get motivated by necessity. So like, don't wait for the right moment or the right weather. Like just create the necessity. It's going to happen. Like instead of waiting for necessity to create itself by getting, you know, cheated on, fired, just decide to create it. Like literally just, I'm going to commit to doing this every day. Like, just, and then make the commitment, make the sacrifice. Like I'm going to uh, commit, I'll pay my friend $200 if I don't do it. I, I, I'll tell everybody that I'm going to do it. And that's like sort of a commitment. Like just commit to it, create the necessity, you're going to do it. And it's, it's people who are like, I can't do it if I don't have necessity. Like, yeah, I agree. I'm like that too. But Nobody said the necessity has to happen to you. You can create it. Yeah, it's true. Um, so what, what would you suggest to someone that wonder if he should use his own name for his company or build, a, create a new company name? Like hide behind the company name? Hide or just have an, a company name instead of his uh, own name being the company name. Uh, well, I think it really depends on the company. Like, you know, it, it wouldn't make sense for Facebook to be called Zuckerberg. You know, I, I think it would be nearly as famous. <laughs> that was the name. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, there's, uh, for example, the investment company Schwab, which is based on Charlie Schwab. And that sounds really awesome. And, you know, Ford, based on Henry Ford. If you have a really, really, really cool name um, that's really catchy, then it would be if your company succeeds, you'll pretty much solidify your name in history. Um, you know, my name is Robbie Frank. So I don't know. I don't really think of if I'll start a company in the future, like for, you know, biz, uh, software company or e-commerce, whatever. I, I won't call it Frank or Robbie. You know, just not really, doesn't really make sense. Um, so I think it's a case by case basis. Perfect. Um, how have you decided what kind of image you wanted to give to the world? What kind of image? Like how you wanted to appear to the world, you and your business. Well, I'm, I'm still working on it today because it's, it's a really, it's a continual process of refinement where on one hand, there's the idea of self-expression. And on the other hand, there's a question of how much of us is like self-expression or how much is like appeasing the people. So, uh, for example, uh, something interesting about Hitler, I know it's really out there. <laughs> like, that's going to be a business question. I'm like, yeah, Hitler. Um, the way, what happened is people think he was like the, the, the meanie, the bad guy who he swayed the entire German people and you know he's such an evil Jew but the thing is it wasn't like that like 
in his speeches, he would like talk about his ideas and he was a very dark person. So he really represented like the dark part of people and some people, and then the, the crowd, he would say something and the crowd would be silent and he would be like, okay, that's a no, no. And then the crowd on the other thing, you know, it's like, we'll take back Germany from the uh, national socialist. And everybody's like, yeah. And he's like, oh, okay. Reinforcement. That's, that's good. Talk about that more. And, he basically refined the process until he became like the embodiment of people's like anger, you know, kind of like what Trump did by the way, uh, with his populist speech, like, yeah, drain the swamp, build the wall, you know, it's, or, or even Barack Obama, you know, hope change. And it's like, uh, how much of that is really you? How much of that is really like appeasing your audience, you know? So as long, as long as you don't like, uh, sell out, like don't say something that you don't believe in or don't value, you're good. So I'm continually doing it like where I'm putting out messages that are the feel right to me. I'm seeing what people respond to. And then let's say people say, okay, we really like that thing that you talk about. Then I know I'm going to talk about it more. So it's, it's still me because it came from me, I just, but I also am very um, attuned to what actually works. So it's not something that's final. You'll ne you're never like, yeah, that's my message. Uh, which, again, that's what happened with Hitler. It's like, when people are like, okay, we don't really want to, you know, exterminate Jews anymore, or we're not really up for that. He's like, no, no, that's the message. I, that's, it's final. That's what we're doing. Because at this point, he was like a dictator. Um, so you don't want to be like a dictator. You, know? you want to be like, this is the message. You have to love it. You, you always want to be like pinging off your audience. Like, you know, this is my truth. And then the audience reacts. Okay. You like this part of the truth? Let's talk about more. But it's still my truth. And uh, yeah, you just continue to do that forever. Great. And um, how... How have you uh, been, uh, how have you made yourself be known? Well, um, there's three ways you can get yourself really, really known. Uh, the, the first one is, um, I, I, I already say ahead of time, I probably forgot the third, but the first one is simply going viral. And that's uh, what I call, that's like the courage approach. And you do that by, doing something that will go viral. Like people think it's very difficult to go viral, but it, it's not that difficult. I know that because I did it because I decided to do it. Like you, you literally just have to ask yourself like what would go viral <laughs> and, and your brain just knows, but unless you have the, con the necessity to do it, you, you won't do it because it will usually be something that's like either like a ton of work in terms of like money or time effort quality or it'll be something like super provocative like the way i got viral was i, I stood up like in my beach apartment at the time like I was, it was like on the beach and it's like it's me with the suit the beach is behind me i'm like you know on the balcony and i'm like i make more money than you your mom your dad your father your mother <laughs> together uh and i invite you to a lecture and, and, and that got so picked up so quickly because people were like you know, nothing picks up like anger, like that spreads like four times faster, I think, than anything else. Um, so, I mean, I had the necessity to, to do it. You know, it literally just took out my, a friend of mine just took out the phone, filmed it, uploaded it, it's uh, it, it gone viral. Um, so, so if you have the necessity to go viral, meaning you have something, you make yourself have to go viral. Like you create some sort of commitment where I have to get, to make a video that will get like 10,000 views and you commit to it. Like you seriously put up like some sort of a risk where you really, you can't deceive yourself because it's numbers. You either do, you either succeeded or not. And you know, there's like consequences if you'll fail. Even if you don't have any idea how you'll do it, your subconscious will just know because you do know what well, works. You just won't admit it because you're not willing to do it. Um, so if you, that's one way, okay. So to create the, the commitment and just do something that's like, poof, 
like either super high quality or super provocative or something. Um, that's one way to get really picked up fast. But if you don't have the ethics to support it, meaning if you're not, if you're not actually like a really good person, a really honest person, people are going to look at you, you're going to be interested and then it's going to be, you know, disappear or they're going to hate you. So, you know, you want to be a really good person so that that attention actually sticks with you rather than just disappearing. Um, which is what happened to me, by the way, because I, uh, that was before I kind of learned about ethics for me. So what happened was uh, it got really, really viral, but I didn't know how to handle it because I didn't have a handle on myself as a person. So I wasn't really deeply ingrained in truth. Uh, the second way is paid advertising. Uh, that's something that most people miss. Um, the reason people grow, it's not because they, you know, of course there's, you know, some YouTubers and stuff, but I'm talking about like a business, you know, or even YouTube as a business. Uh, you know, instead of going on luck, hoping, you know, people will pick you up, literally just create a good sales funnel. Like what, what's good about my coaching? Although I'll have to admit, I never actually tried it. I don't know why. Maybe that's a sign that's the right time is that, uh, when I close clients, it's usually around $2,000 per sale. And I have to talk to just five, six people to get that sale. So in, in all actuality, I just need like five or six leads that came up that, called me, you know, booked a call with me to get a call. So me, meaning like, even if you get like $50 per lead using advertising, a hundred dollars per lead, $200 per lead, you're still profitable. So just the better your, your, uh, profit margins are, the better your, you know, the more money you make per viewer or per whatever it is that you do, the more, uh, easier it is to grow because if you have a really high profit margin, you can use paid advertising and literally the paid advertising pays for itself. And this is like a continual growth where you buy growth using sales. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the second way is to get a really good sales machine going. Uh, and for that, I really recommend the book dot com secrets. Like that's literally the Bible for it. Uh, my friend, the one that's making like over a hundred thousand dollars a month at age 23, that's, he said like hundred percent of the way, he, the reason he can do it is because of this book. And the third way that's now I remember it is just is word of mouth. So, um, of course all the, the two other ways also support word of mouth. So, you know, if you go viral, people talk to each other and if you do Facebook or paid marketing, people also talk to each other when they see it, but word of mouth, what that means is just exclusively like, somebody really likes you and your service or product or video, whatever. It's so good. It's so fucking good that he'll tell three people. So you just grow because of quality and you know, cool. I mean, if you can grow through quality, then it's, it's, uh, you know, it would be a good thing to augment it with paid advertising, but you have to have one of the three, like, if you're not going viral, if you're not using paid advertising or, and if people are not talking about you with other people, you're not going to grow. And the cool thing about my coaching, that's something that I actually want to refer to. Um, at many points, uh, I've, for example, last year in October, I would make three to five videos every day. And it was like the biggest fun ever. And I had, uh, maybe 40 views per video, not, not more than that. And I still close at least three or four clients every month. So I would make at least $8,000 a month from four or 5,000 views a month. Um, and the reason for that is because I would do a lot of free coaching and somebody would get coached by me and he would tell his friends about me and they would watch it. And some of them would go on a free coaching call with me and they would tell their friends, so I wasn't getting a lot of attention, for, attention from a lot of people, but the attention that I was getting was very deep. So it's not just how many people, it's also how deep the attention is uh, because uh, the average view watch time for the videos was like five, six minutes. So every single view was like somebody sitting on average for like five or six minutes just watching me. Um, again, and I had like four or five videos a day sometime. So deep, you know, uh, so again, viral, paid, or word of mouth, or a combination of them. 
Perfect. Uh, so, how have you became an expert in uh, your in your field? Well, I don't I don't consider myself an expert in my field. I have uh, experience, and this experience allows me to. I have experience and I have really good uh, skill of like thinking well. So all that I really do is just say what happened to me and I align people's thinking where they have obstacles that are not really there and I just kind of put them aside and show them like a clear path where that's like the comment that I get the most is, oh, you put it so simple, like not just simple, but simple but practical. Like, oh, wow, that's, that's like, you made it so simple and assailable. I can actually do it now. Um, it, again, it comes back to the mentors, to be honest, like the mentors, you have to have that, Like you have to have somebody who's so much better than you. They will just catapult you up. And from there, uh, you know, like I just made a lot of good Missed, like I, I just d experimented a lot. I did really dangerous stuff for good and bad. So I learned what not to do and what to do. Uh, and the more experiment, the more risky you go. Of course, you also gain experience faster, but also it's more painful. So yeah, just just um, having a mentor and doing lots of shit. <laughs> Great. And... Uh... What would you say to someone that wants to have a build his business, but he's scared to do it? Um, hmm. Well, you should be scared. <laughs> um, you should be scared because if you succeed, uh, you might not handle your finances properly and make your family go bankrupt. If you don't do it well, uh, you might waste a whole lot of time. Um, you should be scared because you don't know what you're doing. And it's, that's a very common thing. It, it's a good thing that you're scared. It means you have common sense. But if you find a mentor, like I told you, like somebody who's much, much better, there's not going to be any fear. Because fear is only like the absence of belief or evidence. So if there's a, a really dark room, you know, and you're like a kid, you're scared to go in there, you know, think there's monsters in it. And then one of the adults gets in, turns on the light, says, you know, see, there's nobody here. And, you know, if it's not a horror movie, then nothing actually happens. And you're like, okay, it's good. I'm not scared anymore. I can go in the room. So you need to have an adult that guides you. Like, you know, you should be scared opening a business on your own. But if you had a mentor, you won't be scared because, well, you have somebody to guide you. And what do you personally do to keep going when time are getting hard? Well, for me, that's where love really comes in. Um, I'm a very more emotional than I would like to admit, um, which means that it, it's very hard for me to keep motivated unless I have something bigger than me that I do it for. So for me, having somebody in my life uh, that I love that is bigger than me, like we know when you love somebody, you'll do it. You'll be there for them, whether you want, you know, you feel like it or not. But when it's yourself, you won't always be there for you if you don't feel like it. So by having somebody that you deeply care about, and it could be a family, by the way, it's, it's a lot easier to go forward in rough times. So you want to connect your motivation intrinsically to something bigger than you. So when, so you opening a business and becoming successful, it's not just you. It's also, oh, you're going to help your mom stop working so she can enjoy the last freaking 30 years of her life. And they're not going to have to live in a shitty house anymore. And you can pay them back for everything they've done to you, for you. And you can help other people with charity or 
again, if you have a partner, you can build a really good life together. So the more your motivations are based on things beyond you, uh, the easier it will be to go in tough times because again, when somebody you love is in trouble or you want to help somebody that you love, then your emotions don't really are not really a factor. It's only when it's about you that emotions are a factor. Like, Oh, I don't know if I feel like it, you know, but if like your, you know, your wife or your husband is like, look, I really need you right now. Not going to be like, Hmm, do I feel in the mood to be there for them right now? Like if you think that, then something deeply wrong with um, yourself or the relationship, but because it just should be automatically, yes, I'm here. Yeah, it's totally true. Um, what, what tips will you give to someone that is in the early stage of his business? It's been, let's say, a year or two that he's in business. Well, is he succeeding or is he procrastinating or let's say su succeeding succeeding yeah identify exactly what, what i'd say what are the, like the three main things that are the most important to the growth cycle every single day repeat to you and your team what these things are so you never forget them and uh stay humble So stay ambitious, but stay humble. So never think you're above the, sorry, never think you're above the process where, oh, we're growing. It's because I'm amazing. Like, no, it's because you did things right. If you're going to keep doing them right, it's going to keep moving up. And the pressure to do it right is going to be higher and higher. So you have less room to screw up the bigger it gets. And be easier to screw it up. So keep reminding yourself, refining it. Like, okay, it's action A, B, and C. Like, these are the three things that when we just focus all our attention on, you know, it's not answering emails. It's not designing the logo or, you know, it's, it's, it's the sales calls. It's the, the uh, Facebook marketing and it's the really good customer service. And just keep reinforcing it. Like, like bam, 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 like every day. Like, remember Improve this, improve this, and improve this. And keep working on it. Again, while staying humble, realizing we're succeeding because of those things, not because it's us. Um, it's, it's just the Matthew principle. Like, keep doing things that work or the Pareto distribution. And it, you will exponentially grow. Because you already have momentum behind you. So even if you start fucking up, because you have the growth process um, you have to do a lot of mistakes to kind of revert it to decline. So just keep pressing on the gas while like, realizing exactly what makes it work. And uh, it's just going to accelerate and accelerate. So the problem begins when people like change the fundamentals, like don't let go of the fundamentals unless you're absolutely sure. And I mean, absolutely like scientifically sure that it's safe to start letting them go slowly and using other fundamentals. Great. And uh, the last question I have for you is what, what all the path of that you didn't did in your life of being entrepreneur, what have it give to your life? What did being an entrepreneur give to my life? Yeah. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, well, I don't really view it like um, there's this dichotomy where you're either an entrepreneur or you're not. Uh, I think you're always an entrepreneur. <laughs> like when you go to you know, meet a potential partner, you're being an entrepreneur. When you have a job, you're an entrepreneur in your job. But um, You know, so there are people who are much more entrepreneurial than me, like by vast magnitudes, but they're employed, they have a, a boss. So we're living currently in an age of entrepreneurialism, meaning that 
we lived in the agriculture stage and then the factory stage and then the knowledge stage where you know you had to learn now we're living in the entrepreneurial stage where a company can disappear in three or four years or a complete sector could be taken over by 30 dudes in a basement you know and a couple of girls too because it's uh, diversity today um so it's not like that I'm an entrepreneur per se, but it's that that's not the way I see it. At least of course, that's not the definition of entrepreneur. You know, so the definition is somebody who like takes risks with money to make money. Uh, I think entrepreneur, like from the idea of like innovator, like where you do things out of the box and you try new things and, you know, and there's again, the dichotomy, like, Oh, if you have a job, you're not like that. Um, I think it's, it's like the, the most, the only thing you can do today that's rational, like not being innovating today or entrepreneurial, it's, it's death. Like you, you know, right now it, it may not look like that, but 10 years from now, uh, it's called, it's called a Turkey dilemma. I think the Turkey problem where the Turkey, you know, he lives in the barn and he gets fed every day and everything is really awesome. Like he's really good life. And, um, He's like, oh, you know, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong, nothing's wrong. One day on Thanksgiving or a day before Thanksgiving, like, you know, gets his head chopped off, didn't see, where, didn't see it coming. So that's what happens when you're not, you don't have that entrepreneurial thing where you are adapting to changes. So something happened and you can innovate your way out of it. And people who don't do that in their life, whether it's through, so for example, people, guys who approach girls, not fucking Tinder, but actually approach women are very entrepreneurial. Always. They're very, very entrepreneurial because they're used to the unknown and, you know, discomfort and what's going to happen, you know? So if they lose their job, they're like, fine, I, I'm, I'm used to being out of my comfort zone. I'm used to discomfort. There's boom, just bounce right back, find an even better job. But somebody who's like not used to like getting out of this comfort zone and doing new stuff, when change happens and change happens faster and faster in this era, you're not going to be able to deal with it. So it's important that entrepreneurialism as a value, not as like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur, but like even as an employee, start doing stuff out of the box. Like if you work in an office, ask what's what is one thing I can do that's outside of my uh, kind of like my job description that can make my boss more money or you know make it more efficient or just be good for the company which again means making more money you do that thing your boss if it's a good boss like somebody you know who appreciate like should appreciate that stuff that's what most good bosses do they'd be like whoa we got an entrepreneur and just they're going to promote you. And you also, again, if you get fired for any reason, you're already in the habit of like, Oh, let's think out of the box. So I would, I would summarize with the word adaptability. I think that's like the key is like entrepreneurialism taught me to be adaptable, to be able to travel, to move, to, get out of any situation. So, you know, you're in financial trouble, you need this, you need that, you want to improve your income. There's always a way, like you're never like, oh, it's big, I need, I'm dependent on my boss. You're not, that's stupid. Like making more money, he's going to pay you more. You're like, you know, I'm a good employee. No, you're not. Like find a way to make your boss an extra $10,000 a month. I guarantee you he's going to increase your income by $1,000. And if he's not, quit your job, find another employee, and this the next one will because good impl good uh, bosses, you know, good CEOs or you know upper ups, they 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 recognize people who benefit the company. <laughs> so yeah, like you know, th th that's I think the cool thing about it. It it teaches you how to think. It teaches you to that the solutions that, you know, you can always change and evolve and, and that you're never dependent on somebody else to give you something. Like, of course you, you are in the sense that you need the money from the person, but you're not dependent on one person 
you always have the initiative and and that's another one that's like really cool where the you realize the power of initiative like the fact that you want to get something create initiative like you know you want to get more money take initiatives towards more money don't don't wait don't ask for it just start doing it you know you want to raise start making the company more money and then ask for a raise um so yeah just adaptability the ability to feel comfortable with the changes of life that's really important because some people when life changes dude they 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 freak out they completely freak out so do you have anything that you want to say to the people that will be watching this video yeah um i wanted to share something that actually uh, recently uh happened was i actually like i told you like i think there's three values so mine is are like uh growth and progress uh truth and ethics and the third one is like love and, and being good to someone um once i found my third value like com completed the package quote unquote uh what happened was i s immediately started to feel like imagine if your happiness is like one of one out of you know uh, uh, one to ten uh it's like a plus one or plus two constant to my happiness uh, it's like it's like i found the fact that even in the shit like when you're really like in a bad situation or a bad time um being proud of who you are is is like it's the thing like it's the best thing ever so so the last thing i would say is like find your values your three values, you know, it's going to take a lot of time and you have to ask yourself every single day, like, what are my values? What are my values? Three values, three values, three values until the answers start coming. Your brain will basically start recognizing the patterns slowly. <clears throat> and, um, and once you know what they are and you actually live by them and you keep kind of like refining your values and getting closer and closer to the type of person that you can be, the type of person that you respect and admire, you really like it, it, it makes all the difference in life. So I, I would just finish with this is like, whatever you do, wherever you are, um, work daily, literally like do a daily report, like every night to, and ask yourself questions about how you can be better tomorrow than you were today. And you do that for like 10 years, you're going to be in the top, 0.1% of people, not in the world, but in the United States, for example, I'm not saying even, you know, in the top of, so you could say one top 0.0001% of the people in the world, because the amount of people that sit down every day and ask themselves, what did I do today where tomorrow I could be better than that? Like tomorrow, like I was a bit angry today, tomorrow I'll be a bit more patient. I was a bit, I didn't take enough action today. Tomorrow I'm going to take just a bit more. And just the thinking about it, just the fact that you thought about it, that you recognized it, because seeing is the change, you know, and that's really something you, actually, you can actually take from the Bible. And this is something I'm saying as a non-religious person is that when you see something, that's when it happens or changes, when you can look at things. So by seeing where you fuck up and seeing how tomorrow you could not fuck up like that, even the potential of it, your brain is gradually scalp, sculpting yourself into the best version of who you can be, you know, day by day. And the Pareto principle of distribution, distribution or the Matthew principle, that's both names for it. It means that the growth is exponential, but also loss is exponential. So, so you it's small improvement, small improvement, and then it's like bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And, 10 years from now, you're not going to be like linearly improving like this. It's going to be like slow, 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 slow. And then suddenly like, boom, like it shoots up. And if you look at everything from economic growth, company growth, uh, the internet growth, the growth of videos, growth of YouTube channels, uh, growth of softwares, growth of anything, 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 anything. It's always like, it's like a, a hockey stick curve. I think that's what it's called. It's like, it goes like this, it goes like this, and then phew, it just shoots up. It's like, it's also Moore's law, for example, that technology doubles its power every year. 
you you look at just right Moore's law in in Google, like search for the image, like you see it, like boom, it goes. That's why people say we're in a virtual reality because they say that imagine like how technology progressed in the last thirty years, the probability that we're in a right now in a fictional reality, like a digital digital reality, are like almost a hundred percent, because a hundred years from now. Technology is going to be about a 10 trillion of a trillion times stronger than today. So imagine how realistic computers are, can simulations can be today. Imagine when they're 10 trillion by trillion times better. Um, so it's, that's what's so cool. That's what's so cool. It's Matthew principles. The fact that you keep improving daily and you just, you just, you don't even need to have faith. You just need to have rational scientific understanding of how this principle works for good or bad. It's not, it doesn't care if it's good or bad. It just, it works in this principle. Um, just keep making a tiny effort. Just keep, you know, you're uploading videos to YouTube. Keep uploading videos. Don't fucking stop. You, you know, you're uh, uh, working out. It's not really working yet. Keep going, keep going. Just every day, just ask yourself, how can be just be a bit better than yesterday? How can the videos be just a bit better? How can it be just a bit more honest? How can I handle my finances just a bit better? Just every day, how can I get to know my values just a bit more? Every day you do that, it's going to go, then it's going to shoot up and it's going to happen to you like, you know, a couple of weeks, months along the way. And you're going to be like, whoa, that was insane. That, that would be like a very small part of the shooting up. You think it's like this thing, but it's just the beginning. And, you know, 10 years from now, you do that and suddenly your, your income goes up like 10 times, like in a month, you know that's what happens. Like that's how people become billionaires. That's how people become famous, successful. Like it's, it's literally like, there's like a surge and then another surge that's like 10 times bigger then another surge that's like 10 times bigger. And you literally, you just take over the world like that. So, uh, I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds way too optimistic, but I don't think so. I think it's very scientific. So just imagine 50 years of asking yourself every single day, how can you be better? And, all aspects of your life. How can I be better tomorrow? How can I be better tomorrow? Th that's re that really makes me horny to get up every morning. Like that, that I thinking of like, whoa, like if I just, even if it's slow, even if, you know, I don't really see the change yet. Like it just, how it's going to look next year, 10 years, 50 years, like knowing that it's exponential. Uh, you know, that makes me want to be consistent more than anything. So yeah, that's like my final message. Great. So uh, thank you to have accepted to do this interview with me. Yeah, sure. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> great success. <laughs> yeah. And uh, if uh, you're watching this video and you want to know more about Roby, just look in the description and uh, there will be some information about him and uh, how you can find more info uh, about him. So thanks for watching this video. And uh, thanks, Roby, again to accepting for doing this interview. My pleasure, man. Thank you.